Welcome back to Recorded Conversations, the podcast that's dedicated to compassionately considering all perspectives while engaging in authentic, connected dialogue. I'm Danielle Kingstrom. It's like I don't even know what to say anymore. That's really where I'm at right now. I, I had to take a break from social media. So I deactivated my Facebook. I logged out of Twitter. I logged out of Instagram. And I deleted the Facebook app, the Twitter app, and the Instagram app from my devices. So if I want to go check out what's going on, I literally have to open up my laptop and sit down and go through the motion. But I also have little post-it notes affixed everywhere telling me not to go on social media because social media is toxic right now. I was having a conversation with my friend Cordell about this over the week, and we were talking about how toxic it has become. But the thing is, is people are trying to make social media the, the, the platform for connection, for authentic connection, mind you. People are saying virtual connection is connection. We're normalizing a lacking form of intimate connection and calling it our new normal. Number one, I have to ask, did we ever have a normal? What's normal? What was normal before coronavirus? Was it normal to have the guy who was famous for saying you're fired be our president? Is that normal? In 1980, when Ronald Reagan was sworn into office, that wasn't normal. Was it normal to have a Hollywood actor become a president? And now we have a reality star actor as our president? By all definition, within that time span, which is my lifetime, because I was born in 1980, that was normal for me. It was normal to see a celebrity as a politician. And we balk at it now? I don't think we've ever experienced normal. I haven't. I don't know what is normal. I know that the life that I live isn't quote unquote normal. I'm introverted. My nearest neighbor is a mile away. We have 9,000 pigs that live on our site. Our cows roam the yard in the same way that your dogs and cats probably roam your yard. I don't live a normal life. I'm a homeschool mom. I've been doing this for five years. I podcast from my house. My husband gets up every day and he goes and works. Is it normal that one income supports a family of seven? Because I've always been told that's not normal. I've been told that's not even possible. So what is normal? When you sit inside your own home and you look outward, is out there not normal to you, but your house and what's going on inside is normal? How do we discern what normal is? These are just some of the things that I think about when I hear people talk about, nothing is going to be normal. We're going to have a new normal. Folks, we never had a normal, so let's stop calling this stuff normal. This is just life. Nothing is normal about life. Nothing is organized about life. If we even look at Merriam-Webster's definition of normal, normal is stated as this, a conforming to a type, standard, or regular pattern, according with constituting or not deviating from a norm, rule, or principle, occurring naturally. What occurs naturally that's normal, that's in a regular pattern, that is a standard, that conforms to a type, that doesn't deviate away from rules or principles in your life? Just sit with that for a minute and ask yourself that. Now look outward. Everything that's taking place, everything that takes place every day, we see the news. We see all of these horrible tragedies that occur all over the world. Disease kills people. We hear about women being raped. Is that natural? Is that normal? Is sex trafficking natural? Is that normal? Is racism natural? Is that normal? What is normal? The programs and the paradigms that they, they... I use the word they. I use the word they to represent the quote-unquote powers and principalities as referenced in the Bible. And they as the system, the people who control everything. Because you and I both know we're not really in control of anything. There are other people that are in control. They're usually the ones with the power and the money. So they tell us what is normal, don't they? But 
what happens after they tell us something is normal? They flip it upside down on us and tell us it's not normal. They create conformity standards for us to follow along with in these paradigms, and they shift it. And sometimes the people shift it. Sometimes it's a revolution that creates a new normal. Sometimes it's a reformation. But is it actually producing something normal? Is it producing something natural? Is it producing a conforming structure that everybody agrees with? Because if you ask me, just based on my short 40 years here, I don't see a lot of normal. I've never seen normal. So I don't have an expectation of a normal or of a new normal. If you ask me, everything's always chaos. And every once in a while, we have a little calm of organization and of order. But most of the time, it feels like my life is just storm after storm after storm after storm after storm. Right now, there's a storm brewing outside my house. The lightning was flashing in the middle of the day. It was the weirdest thing. Not normal, but natural. If we're talking about naturally occurring instances, such as weather, which is is natural to a degree. Although I don't know anymore because now I'm being told that some of our weather might not really be natural weather, but man-made weather? How do we keep up? This is what I'm talking about, folks. We don't know what normal is. Normal for me is storms. And living a farmer's life, storms are a very relevant part of our, our season. We play by ear with storms. Everything has to be done within this small little time frame before the storm comes. And then we have to wait. And there's usually a period of a few days where we're like, is it going to stop raining? Is it going to dry up? Is the wind going to pick up? Are we going to have some dry land again? But storms are normal. And if storms are normal, then we shouldn't expect there to not be a storm. So storms are the norm, which means we're always going to get wet. There's always going to be some mud. We're always going to have to wait for things to dry out. It feels like that's what we're doing right now while we're sheltered in place and quarantined and locked down and forbidden from freely leaving, forbidden from freely working. We're in a storm. Whenever I think about storms, I think about the year we had a tornado. My babies were so little and I was so scared and it ripped through our backyard. I mean, it was just a few hundred feet away from shredding our home and trapping us in the basement. And it was scary. It was so scary. And I don't think I ever prayed as much as I did in that one moment when I felt like I was bracing for a freight train to plow through my house. What happened was, though, is it passed us. It took out some trees. It made a huge mess. It destroyed a lot of buildings. We had insurance claims. And we had so much work ahead of us. We had already planted our garden. So we were devastated because we had depended on that garden to feed us through the winter. And, oh, my poor tomatoes. It was the year that I spent extra money and bought fancy heirloom seeds. I had all these different varieties. I was going to enter into a farmer's market world that year. And just nothing Nothing was going to go according to plan after that storm. Everything was going to change. But we lived. We made through it. And we learned some things. We, we discovered issues on the property that we should have addressed years ago that the storm had highlighted for us. Things we wouldn't have noticed had we not had to do the things that we did. We started seeing things that we were missing. Opportunities that we had missed in the past to up our yields, to better protect us, to be better sheltered from a future storm. And so we made adjustments and we move forward. And I've never been that close to a tornado again. But every time there's a storm, I brace and I get scared. I get real scared. Storms in me, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I've always been fearful of inclement weather. And the storm started brewing today. And the clouds were getting all funky and dark again, just like that day we had the tornado. And my mind went haywire. That's what happens when we are confronted with storms. They scare us. But the one thing that always comes to surface for me when I think about storms is I think about the Gospel of Mark. And the only reason I think about the Gospel of Mark is because I spent almost a year reading through a book by Dr. Alexander John Shia called Heart and Mind. And that takes you through a transformational journey utilizing the four Gospels. He talks about Mark's storm. 
And then, and that's how we move through suffering is through the storm. And the calming of the storm is one of my favorite passages from the Bible. And I just want to read that to you. Let you just kind of soak that in and absorb it for a little bit and think about it as I continue to talk about this storm. So this is Mark 5, 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus and the disciples are trapped on a boat. Jesus is napping. He's sleeping. Everybody else is panicked and they're, you know, how's this dude sleeping? There's a storm. Jesus knew that, you know, the only way to get past a storm is to get through it. And they were going to go through it. They had no other choice. And he had faith. He had faith that there would be a clearing after the storm. Maybe he knew that there was always going to be a storm and that we were just going to have to figure out how to weather it. But that's the thing that we're experiencing right now. This is a really big freaking storm. And there's going to be a lot of debris and there's going to be a lot of cleanup and there's going to be fatalities. There's going to be devastation. There's going to be loss and grief unparamount to what we've ever seen before. But we're going to get through it. I was reinvigorated. I was inspired today as I was finishing up uh, a copy of someone's manuscript. My friend Todd Vick, whom I've had on the show before, sent me over the manuscript of his second book. And it's all about reconstruction. His first book was called The Renewing of the Mind. And this book that is slated to be released soon is called The Reconstructing of the Mind. Now, the one thing I want to tell you that I love about this book, I can't wait for you guys to read it. And I was so honored that I got to see it. Reconstruction is first and foremost about right relationship, right relationship with God, with yourself, and with the rest of the world. Not only that, but reconstruction is about reaching out. We're going to have to reconstruct the entire planet. We know that. We know that there were areas that we were derelict on. And if there's anything that I think holds true about any kind of stereotypical label that we put over progressives and conservatives, it's this. Progressives prepare. Conservatives just deal with the consequences. And I might add, not so delicately, not so gently, not so efficiently. But that's the one thing that the progressives have over the conservatives. They're always preparing. And that's what we know about these big organizations who United Nations, Bill Gates Foundation, and the basic liberal agenda is to always plan ahead. Think 5, 10, 15 steps and years ahead. They were thinking about it. They were trying to figure out a reconstruction plan for global devastation. And what happened was the storm came before they finished building the shelter. Reconstruction, that's going to be what we depend on. Right now we're going through a renewal, I think. And I think it's a lovely way to juxtapose it with Mr. Todd Vick's books. This is a renewal for us right now. We are being forced to think about things more critically. We are asking more questions. We might not believe in everything we see on the surface or anything that MSM is telling us. Maybe you're like me and you see things and you hear things, but you know that's not all there is. You know there's something underneath the surface. Renewing your mind is about doing that. It's about digging deeper. It's about not just taking everything as it is at face value and looking beneath it and seeing what's really being revealed. Reconstruction, on the other hand, is after you tear everything down, after the storm rips through and devastates your garden or your house or your entire world, we have to reconstitute it. We have to rebuild it. We reconstruct. And how do we do that? It starts with right relationship. It starts with right relationship with yourself, with God, and with everybody else. And when you can get that paradigm down, that will be your normal. Right relationship should be our normal. And I struggle with it, y'all. I struggle, oh, struggle so bad. I'm so bad. And here's the thing. 
I know that I struggle with it and I want to overcome it. And so that's just a part of my journey right now is learning how to reconstruct this idea that it's okay for me to be committed and connected to a larger community that I can't control. Isn't that funny? We're real good in our houses, right? Like I am, like I run a tight ship. I got the control. Ask my husband. I'm the boss. But when it extends further outward, away from my house, away from my people right here, I don't have control. And then the commitment becomes really scary. Commitment becomes its own storm for me, right? Commitment asks me to give of myself in ways that aren't convenient and aren't comfortable and don't benefit me in any way, shape, or form. And we all struggle with that. I'm not the only one that goes through this. But that's a, it's difficult. So that's part of my reconstruction too, is figuring out how to commit to the connections that we make. Now, social media is not going to deliver us the authentic, intimate connections that we need to maintain a healthy mentality. Will it be a buffer? Will it be good enough for what we got going on right now? Perhaps, so long as we don't normalize that. So long as we don't act like social media is the one and only vehicle towards connection because it's missing true presence. It's missing touch, sensation, smell, taste even if you kiss people like I do. I kiss my husband. A kiss wouldn't be the same kissing a screen. A hug wouldn't be the same from a screen. That touch is really important. So look, I encourage you all to use social media, to reach out to people, to find ways to connect so that you're not alone, so that you're not lonely, so that you can be seen and heard. But let's not normalize it as a new, effective way to relate to people. It doesn't make relationships real. That's not what making relationships real is about. Now a segue into the introduction of the next episode. Dr. Leslie Goth joins me yet again, and we have a conversation about trauma, about porn addiction, about unhealed wounds, about sexual vulnerability. So... This is going to be a little different topic than what you might be used to right now, given the news cycles and all of the stories that we're covering. We're not talking about coronavirus here. We're talking about eroticism. We're talking about a positive sexuality. We're talking about how can we be more real within our relationships. So this is our second Ask Dr. G series with the incredible Dr. Leslie Goth. You can find her on Facebook by visiting Denver Family Counseling Services or by logging on your internet, denverfamilycounselingservices.com. And I also want to give a shout out to Todd Vick, writer of The Renewing of Your Mind, which is available on Amazon and upcoming The Reconstructing of Your Mind. So way to go, Todd. I can't wait for everybody to read your book. And one of the reasons I really appreciate the work that he has contributed to this kind of deconstruction, reconstruction ideology is it will help you become more vulnerable and open to the idea of an erotic epiphany. So enjoy the episode. Check out Dr. Leslie Goth. Check out Todd Vick. Make sure that you are liking this podcast. And if you think it's beneficial, if you think it'll help somebody else, don't forget to share it with your friends. Sharing is caring. Be safe, everybody. Spread love and not the coronavirus. to look at the behavior but we really have to understand the person and what's going on with the person yeah and i love that and i love him mm, i'm gonna look into I love him. him i wrote it down yeah, he's that fantastic i like he's... i like listening to um dan savage yes. too have you heard yeah of... yeah yeah I've, I've been looking up he's a stuff. he's a little <laughs> he's a little crass but I've learned a lot from him and i think he's gone on speaking tours with esther perel too and um oh cool yeah, his stuff is fun, but he's like, sometimes he's just like, 
he's got one chapter in his book where he's like, okay, well then just fucking cheat. And I'm like, what? what? Yeah. But it's like after you've exhausted every other potential idea and you have these sexual fantasies or urges that you think you need to satisfy and like breaks down just like step by step how to do it. And I'm like, this is. Does he recommend talking to your partner first? This is after, (laughs) yes, you've exhausted all potential with your partner and your partner is just like, no, no, no. And I remember reading about that and talking about it with my husband. And I was just like, is there not a boundary though? Like, you know, and it just makes you think. And if some people are like that, cool. But if there's, if there's a boundary of, is there a boundary? Cause like, sometimes I worry about people who are like, have like really crazy sex ideas. And I'm like, I want to tell you to like creatively embrace everything, but there's a boundary. You have to draw a line. Yeah, absolutely. And we can't go this whole route of like, nothing is immoral because like, that's. No, there are I boundaries mean, for sure. There for sure. For but sure. I like how just, just his crassness just makes me think about that. And I think it's helpful to go, okay, well, I'm willing to push my boundaries back, but I'm still willing to have boundaries. No, and it's good conversation, right? I mean, if if we're not willing to at least, you don't have to change your boundary, but let's talk about it, and then you always still come back to what you're comfortable with and what lines up with your own values, right? Um, But it's great to just talk about it. That's why I love what you do because it just brings up such great conversation where people are not having these conversations because they're taboo or they're shame or whatever and no let's just talk it's okay it's okay let's explore all these great ideas that are out there and when you sent me that email after you had read my blog I was just like ah I'm so happy someone gets it because I think and I say this only based on my own experience but it seems like women have a much harder time even talking to other women about it But men are like, I saw your article. I have all these issues. Help me. And no joke. I have so many people that are like, can you help me? And I'm like, and, but it's men, it's men. It's like men are so willing to be vulnerable and share their stories and their traumas and their experiences. And I'm like, what? what is going on here? That should be like the women's shtick. Like we're the storytellers. I wonder if it's again, then I wonder if it's so much of society and culture and family upbringing that really have trained women, whether, whether it's overt or covert to, you know, just kind of, um, live in this, whether it's a stereotype or we, girls don't talk about these things or to, explore these ideas is not ladylike. It's inappropriate. It's shameful. Yeah. It means you're a slut, you know, like all these things when it's like, no, like women have desires and women have fantasies and women have needs. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Women do have needs. You know, it's funny as my kids, my son was visiting. And so my two older kids are 20 and 18 and I walk in, they're just talking in my daughter's room and I walk in and he's like, yeah, I got your ho gene, mom. And I went, what? <laughs> what? I said, I said, you're not a virgin anymore. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like I got yours and dad's like whoring gene. And I'm like, not sure what you mean by that. Explain. And my daughter's like, you know, cause you were a ho. And I'm like, I wasn't though. Like I, I yeah. was just curious. I said, I was very sexually curious. Yeah. Otherwise known as a ho. And I'm like, no, but I was like, there was always a meaning either. It was for my pleasure. It was for my curiosity. It was to connect. And I'm like, stop looking at it like that. Like I, yeah, there have to be these labels. Why do we look down on people? Cause I'm like, you know what? I am seasoned baby. Thank you. You know? (laughs) And I thought I was seasoned too, but then my husband came along and showed me I really wasn't, but that was my thing. I didn't want to have a boring sex life. I knew that from, I knew that before I had my period, that I was not going to have a boring life period. My parents were, my parents were sex freaks. So, um, and nothing inappropriate, but we just knew they were curious and they were exploring and they were trying to understand our bodies and what this stuff means. And no way. See, there's definitely, that is so rare. Yeah. That is so rare. I have to tell you. 
I know I hear that a lot and I just don't get it. That was my oh, normalcy. Like, no. Seeing my parents not be able to keep their hands off of each other and kissing yeah, all the time see? and touch was so big in our house and caressing and holding and embracing and tickling and cuddling. And we do that too. And my husband said the same thing. He's like, this is so weird. He's like kissing in public, holding hands. What is this? And I'm like, yeah. this is how I roll. This is what we do. And I just, yeah, the more people I meet in here, they're like, what? you do that. I mean, so own- how, how were you, I'm just so curious because since they were so affectionate and open and this is all just natural and healthy, how did you first learn about sex, like intercourse and ha- where babies come from? <laughs> like, um, how did you learn that? Well, I think I learned before they were ready to teach me. I think I walked in on them having sex when I was like three okay. or four. Okay. And, uh, and how did they react? Uh, that's huge. Well, you know, my dad was like, crap, she's in here. And then my mom (laughs) came after they were done. You know, I went back to my room. I was just like, what the hell did I just see? I heard my dad barking. I was confused. (laughs) I heard my dad barking and, um, yeah. And my mom came in and she's like, you good? Are you okay? You know, like, do you want to talk? And I was like, what did I just see? You know? And, um, she told me, you know, she said, when two people are in love, this is some of the things that they do. And then throughout the years, I was so curious, you know, um, and my uncles and my grandfathers all had playboys or penthouses or whatever. My parents had their sex chest. I was nosy. They had dirty playing cards for when the adults came over. Um, And I was just always curious and looked at stuff, but my mom always talked to me about it and and she differentiated like these playing cards and they're just regular playing cards that you play poker with, but they had graphic images on them. Uh Uh, It was like penthouse. And, you know, she said, and I was like six, seven years old. And she said, this isn't love. This is sex. And this doesn't mean anything. That's so interesting. And she wanted me to know the difference. And she said, what mom and dad do is love and it's private. And when you're older, you'll understand it and you'll want it. And she never told me sex was going to hurt. She never told me it was dirty. She just always said, you're not ready yet. And I know you're curious. And I mean, MTV came out when I was growing up and you had George Michael and Michael Jackson and Prince and Prince. Sure. Especially. My parents loved So it. sexual. Like, yes. How yes. do we talk about this? Yes. And they just always answered every question. I'm more so my mom than my dad. My dad would be like, I can't believe we're having this discussion right now. But he always like, you know, just was willing to talk too. And okay. And they shared all their stories from growing up. And I knew my mom and dad were both sexually curious growing up. And, you know, and they told me about all the drugs they did. So when I got older, I was like, I ain't touching that. I know about that. I heard about that. I'm not doing that. No, 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 no. And so they were just always open. But that was the one thing my mom always wanted me to know was there's a difference between sex and love. That is and, beautiful. Yes. And then we, you know, growing up watching Oprah and Ellen and Sally, Jesse, yes. Raphael, and talking yeah. about the difference between objectifying women and appreciating women. And yeah, I just always knew that. And masturbation, when I got caught, uh, I think I was humping a stuffed animal when I was younger. You know, my mom was like, this is cool. You know, this is good. This is fine. You're exploring yourself. Just don't do it in the living room in front of all of us. Go do it in your bedroom. This is a private moment. And it was not, you know, and she didn't shame me. And I mean, when my boys were growing up too, all of them as they're aging, I have to be like, can you go be curious like that in your room? Thank you. Yeah. Or don't do that right now. Or um, but it's never yeah. about, she just never shamed me. And I think because so again, the boundaries shame. without the shame, right? Right. And I yeah. think it was because she was shamed growing up or I don't even know sure. if she was shamed. It was just, there was silence. No one ever talked about anything. And, um, which kind of alludes to shame. Yeah. Well, basically, you know, cause... and, and I love the book, what we were just talking about the erotic mind, because even he says, and Freud said, you know, that children are sexual beings so sexual children from like, <laughs> starting at age three yes right are yeah. curious and for you to say you know i was sexually curious you just talk about that in mainstream and there's so much shame about being sexually curious yeah. we are wired this this way yes. god created us to be curious and the thing is is even though our children are sexually curious they have no idea the context or the lenses that we it. know 
No, and they so don't know how to they manage don't think that. it's bad right. or anything, and they're not, they don't have any of the impressions that we have from society. And that's the one thing that I have to struggle with too, is like, we make comments in the house, like with the older kids or with my husband. And, um, you know, if we say something that kind of sounds, it could go either way. Someone will say, that's what she said, you know, right. Right. Drop we a do little that funny all the time. Line. Yeah. yeah. And the little kids don't know what that means, but they know it's funny right. because they don't have the hypersexualized or objectified sexual view. And we are very mm -hmm. open about talking. Obviously I'm open about talking about sex in front of my kids. You know, it's what I do. Right. But they don't have the impressions we do. And I understand why we get like, oh, oh, don't, don't say that word here. They don't know what we're talking about. And yeah. we're the ones that can form the impression on what we are talking about. So if we do, oh, they're going to hear yeah. that word every time going forward and go, that's a bad thing. And we program right. to them to do that. And we don't even realize it. We're like, don't right. talk about that in front of the kids. Oh, oh, the kids shouldn't have even seen that scene in, in the show. And I'm like that, but now I'm like, I'm not going to run and pause and fast forward the show anymore. I'm going to see right. how they react because if I react like oh, they're going to do the same thing and they're right. going to close up from it or they're going to go, why did mom react like that? Now I'm curious and I'm going to go dig around and then they're going to not have my conversation in context to explain what they're seeing. So we have right. to be really, really careful. I think about, but again, that's rare. The way you're doing it is extremely I know. rare. I know. It's so sad. Yeah. I'm so glad you're doing it that way though. Well, that's what it's for. It's for the children, really. It really is. <laughs> it really is. I mean, because I know I did it wrong because my daughter, and I'm, I don't regret anything, I, but my daughter had a, a, a child at a young age. You know, she's almost got a one-year-old now, and I'm like, I didn't talk to her enough about it. Yeah. Because she wasn't ready. And now she's open, you know? She's sure. Open. And she's even like, do you have anal sex, mom? And can we have this discussion? And I'm like, oh, I love you. Yes, yeah. please. This is what I want, you know? And yeah. whatever yeah. it is, just talk about it. Don't be grossed out about it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Leave those doors open without the shame. Shame's a killer. It is. Just a killer. Yeah. So what questions should we do for Ask Dr. G? I want to know how you address when people come to you about issues related to porn. My husband watches okay. porn. I want him to stop. What, what do you say to something like that? Well, and I, and I just referred you to Joe Court, who is like, he, this is a lot of what his podcasts are about. And I've learned so much from listening to him. And is it Daniel Lay or David Lay? Do you know who I'm talking about? I'm not familiar. It's either David or Daniel Lay, who has like done a lot of research to kind of counter the research that's out there that says that porn is automatically a bad thing and causes mm -hmm. damage to your brain and, and all these things. And so he's, he's done a lot of work and I have his book too, um, that, um, that pornography does not, not necessarily mean a sex addiction. So when someone comes to me about pornography, we have to explore it. You know, how does it make them feel? What are the belief system around pornography? What is the pornography behavior? Like, um, I did have a client who said her husband was watching porn, you know, masturbating daily, was like having sex with strange people. Like mm. you would just kind of contact people and go to their homes and have sex with strangers. So there was a lot of behavior that was obviously very hurtful to their relationship, to her sense of trust, safety, monogamy. I mean, she wanted a monogamous relationship. They did not talk and have any kind of agreement that it was not going to be monogamous. So there's just so much to explore without like immediately assuming it's a sex addiction and the person needs to go to 12 step and abstain from sex and masturbation. I, that is not my first, second or third <laughs> um, approach. <laughs> yeah. I, there's so much needs to be explored and understood because I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing. Now, with that said, I had a 15 year old in my office recently who is under a tremendous amount of stress. Like the family is just imploding. And so when I said to her, so sweetie, like, how are you coping with all this anxiety and stress? And she said, I'm watching porn. I was like, whoa, right? So I was like, okay. 
and I, and we've worked on and off with each other for probably a couple of years now. So she, she knows me, she knows my style. So I said to her, well, let me just kind of tell you where I'm coming from regarding porn. She's a Christian. She goes to youth group. She's told her um, youth group leader and she goes to a special group for kids who are struggling with porn. And I said, you know, I don't approach porn your typical way as a lot of Christians. She goes, oh, Leslie, don't worry about it. I know. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she's like, I know you don't approach. She goes, I know you. I, she, and she's 15. She's so cute. She's like, I know you don't approach it that way. I'm like, okay, good. Now from there, tell me what you're watching. Like, what is it that you are gravitating mm. towards? Because let's understand what's, what's going on here. Well, as it turned out, her porn was just R-rated movies. And maybe I shouldn't even say just, we're so desensitized, right? We're so desensitized to the sex scenes in these movies that that's not pornography, maybe to you or I, yeah. but to her, it was. And wow. so there were just certain scenes in certain R-rated movies that she would just kind of keep going back to to just kind of escape wow. and escape the stress of her family. So, you know, so my approach with her is again, to just understand that, that's an option for her. That that's always going to be an option for her. I'm not going to be like the movie police at her house and tell her like, yeah. don't watch R rated movies. Like that's just not realistic, but what else can she do to manage her anxiety and her stress? Whenever we act out in a way where we're just avoiding, suppressing, um, numbing out, then anything could potentially be damaging to us. I don't care what it could be chewing gum. It yeah. could be watching Netflix. It's, you know, anything where we're just avoiding life. Yeah. And so I want to help her understand, understand her anxiety, normalize it. Absolutely. I mean, this poor kid is just like, it, it's very sad what, what the whole family is going through and it's just very scary. Now, what else can she do to manage the anxiety? So that's yeah. how I approach it. And same thing with a husband and a wife or whatever, you know, any kind of relationship where someone's coming in and automatically making these assumptions that pornography is bad. I'm a defender of porn and it is, mm -hmm. um, I'm so interested in looking up this person though with this new research because I've always felt that too. And I know a lot of people who, you know, consume porn the same way they would cannabis once in a while because it makes them feel good or right. gets them in the mood. And I think we we've taken this idea that the typical porn watcher looks like something and behaves like someone. And I'm over here like, but I like porn. What does that say about me? Like, I like porn. Well, why do you like porn would be the next question. Well, right. I like it because it helps me get in the mood sometimes when I can't get in the mood or right. I explore what I'm curious about. You know, exactly. what am I curious about looking at? And am I curious about experiencing that for myself. But I think, you know, and my husband says it too, sometimes just masturbating helps you go to bed and you want mm -hmm. some kind of an image that is sexual, that is not something you're fantasizing about for the rest of your life, but just something that visually stimulates you so you can go to sleep. I can relate to that. Sometimes I need a melatonin. Right. Me personally, masturbating before bed is too much work, but I'm not going <laughs> to... Yeah, <laughs> but I understand that because there is science behind that too. I mean, there is yeah. a, re a release of chemicals, of melatonin Absolutely. chemicals that will help you go to sleep. That's why sex practice is good for restabilizing a sleep practice, like especially mm -hmm. when you've been dealing with insomnia. I think a lot of insomniacs, I always think, go have sex. You <laughs> go will, have sex. You're going at night. But there is, I think there's a lot of benefit to porn. I think it helps couples explore other ideas and just explore their own fantasies in their minds. And that can do so much for just creating a new connection. So, you know, especially you know when we're disconnected. I think what, you know, so many women typically struggle with, and again, this is just a generalization is comparing themselves to the women oh, in, yeah. in the movies that their husbands are watching. And then yeah. it makes them feel insecure about themselves and, why isn't he having sex with me? And, you know, yeah. they're not seeing anything positive come from it at all. So how do you not get wrapped up in that? How do you, um, I guess, not get jealous or insecure, right? Because I think that's what comes up for so many women. 
Yeah. And I used to, I used to back when I was doing the whole church thing and trying to be a, a, a godly woman. I used to, I used to be like, so you're fantasizing about her. You wishing that was me. You wish I looked like that. You know, I can't look like that. And a lot of that was just for me. I, I grew up loving myself and my body, but after I had children, I couldn't love myself again. I like hated my body. And oh, I was like, there's yeah. just, I just couldn't get over it. And, and it wasn't until I met my husband who was just like, he just, I don't know. He just had a way of every time he looked at me, made me feel like I was the only woman in the world. Yeah. And I did resent my body even after the twins too. And he was like, you're amazing. Your body is oh. like, look the amazing things your body does. Yeah. And it, he, he said something to me too. He's like, I don't see like your body. He's like, I see your soul. I see your spirit. I see oh. your essence. Yeah. And I think that's what we're called to see in each other. Sure. And not only that, but we have to remember, we, we want beautiful features. We want everything aesthetically pleasing, whatever we're not right. seeing, whenever we're watching our advertisements, whatever it is. And so I don't understand how we're not jealous and, and, and envious of just everything we're watching and why we compartmentalize that. But I think a lot of that is what we've always kind of covered ourselves up. And it's hard for us to kind of reveal our, ourselves to even our spouses. I think mm -hmm. maybe because that programming goes further. I, I think we do probably, I don't know, project outward on all the other shows we watch too. So I shouldn't say that, but I had to come to a point where I really loved my body. And it literally meant looking at myself naked in front of the mirror and touching myself and realizing what every part of my flesh has done not only for me, but I've created things because of this flesh. And I had to have a get with me moment and just, I love you. I love you. I love you. And yes, my husband yes. is also very encouraging. And yeah, I don't know. I think, I think we think too much about stretch marks and cellulite and whatever. I mean, yeah, yeah. my, my belly rolls over and I've got like four folds right now. Cause I'm sitting, that's everybody the people yeah. the out there are paid to look that good. Sure. Or pay to look that good. And I, that's not real to me. I don't know. Just for me, I know that's not, that's not real. That's not right. real life. And that would be stressful and a burden for me to have to think that sure. that is what we're supposed to be. So I think sometimes we just have to get to that point where we're like, that's fake. And what but you're also, homes, what you're also describing is just you're, you're secure within yourself. Yes. Finally. Yes. And we, yeah. sometimes it takes a long time for people, but we do. And I recommend that. I think, um, I think after eat, pray, love, I don't know what it was. She learned how to love herself again throughout that journey. Mm -hmm. And I came across some exercise of literally sitting in front of the mirror and finding yes. something to love about yourself. And yeah. Emily Nagoski, who wrote Come As You Are, she mm. also um, expands on that method. And she's like, just start with one thing every day. Right. Then move to three things. Then move to 10 things. Then sit yeah. there and don't stop until you can love every inch of your skin. And you get there wow. because wow. that's all that matters. And God made you in that image. And I just, right. I don't know. Right. For me, I'm like, these are our temples. So we are supposed yeah. to love them. Yeah. And when we learn to love our own bodies, then we can show others how to love our bodies too. And that's even yeah. better. It's like I like that. From that. Yeah. I like that. I'm, I'm going to write that down. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to quote you in a post. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that's really important. And I think that's why I... I kind of lean towards these um, post-Christian, post-evangelical, post-deconstruction circles because yeah. I know that we have to start peeling stuff back. Yeah, and I need I I really appreciate starting with the religion, but I think there's an error when we don't take it to the erotic too. You know what I mean? Like people are like, I deconstructed my religion. Okay, next. Keep moving. No, I'm done. No, you're not. No, I'm going to reconstruct my religion. Uh-uh. We got to keep going. We got to deconstruct all the dimensions of who we think yeah. we are as, a, yeah. as, as our identity. And I don't yeah. know, there's just so much I wish that people would be willing to explore about the erotic self. We talk about the authentic self and the true self. And I'm like, and the erotic self. But 
But that's been pathologized. So it that's has. why we don't go there, right? Yeah. Anything with the word erotic in it, all of it, it, you immediately assume it's sinful. Yeah. So like, that's a shame, right? That that's yeah. been just immediately those assumptions are made when we just say the word erotic. Uh, I know. It's like, <sighs> um, what was it? I was playing with my grandson and I was tickling him and I don't know, something just popped into my head and I was like, this is Eros. Like Eros is a fleshy mm. love. Yeah. It's not a sex. It's not just sex. No. It's a fleshy love. It's like understanding there. There's a connection between my touch to somebody's skin. And you right. know, it's fascinating. I just read this too. Our skin is literally dead. It's dead. Yes. Yeah. Everything on the surface is dead. The only time we understand to feel sensation is when the dead is touched. And I'm like, there's a key there. Like there's a real key there, but even just touching and cuddling and tickling like my grandson and my kids, I'm like, that is erotic. It's the flesh connection that creates a sensation of goodness. It's absolutely eroticism is just right. And eroticism is not just sexual sensation. Yeah. And that's, I think where... Mm -hmm. Where it really needs to start, we need to unpack what we need to deconstruct eros and eroticism. We need to unpack it and and peel it away and get rid of all of these negative layers that are just mm, just calcifying and and killing the potential. I said this to my friend the other day. I was like, you know, they have made sex such a dirty, shameful, taboo thing because they know if we were all having sex and we were all just more interested in physical touch and connection, we wouldn't be pissed off about half of the things that we're pissed off about. This hunger and desire that we have towards the next new thing for me to be outraged, I'm like, why are we not putting that energy towards our, our partners and not even just the sexual energy? But why are we not putting like more just relational, more, yeah, more relational and intimate and in yeah. our own house, right? And, you know, we're like we all think we need to be advocates and social justice warriors. I'm like, but what does your house look like? Why can't we go back to that? You know, a house divided cannot stand. Right. What does your house look like? I don't care what you're trying to do for the world. If you can't do it in your house, you can't so do true. it anywhere else. So true. So and true. That's eroticism. Intimacy right. is eroticism and making sure your most foundational relationships are secure. Yeah, yeah not- I agree. So now we're hung up on politics and not the erotic, <laughs> and it's frustrating. I know. And so coronavirus. And coronavirus. <laughs> if you have more sex, you don't have to worry about the coronavirus okay. because sex is your immunities. So there. <laughs> Also heard cannabis can boost your immunity. So get high, get laid. Have sex. Don't worry and, about the coronavirus. About it. Yeah. <laughs> and drink Heineken if you're really worried. No. Because <laughs> I see people are boycotting Corona beer. And yeah, it's hilarious. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. How about, how do you tell, when someone comes into you and it's like, we're just having a boring sex life. And we don't know mm-hmm. what to do. What do you, mm-hmm. what's your first recommendation? Well, before I recommend, I want history. I want to know. Oh, we're going to go know. make it complex now. Okay. I am going to make it complex. Um, well, because nothing is just a quick fix. You okay. Know? Let me give thing. you, let me give you a syn- synopsis then. How about a couple that is just hovering on the sidelines of understanding what is deconstruction? And someone called me a heretic and my church is looking at me funny because I'm doing this. And they're in the position where they feel like they're comfortable to start peeling stuff away. Mm-hmm. Would you, would you just kind of just read them to see how far you can push them right away without too much? Or are you more, more like, I need to make sure I'm good about this. And I've developed a connection with them. I just always wonder that because in shows, which are obviously fictional, someone comes in and they're like, have you tried a threesome? And they just kind of jump into it and shock them. So do you ever go that route or do you want to make sure that you know what their traumas are? And yeah, I mean, I definitely want the safety in the room for sure. And if it's someone that I've been seeing for a while and then, then they bring up 
this, these issues, then I can shock them. Right. Yeah. Then I'm, then I can go right into, well, do you masturbate? Do you mutually like I can jump right in, but if it's a brand new person and this is what they're coming to me for, for the very first time, then I do, I want to, I want them to know me. I want to know them and just create the safety so that we can explore those deeper layers in a way that's safe and it's not going to send them, you know, running away. So it, it just always depends on the relationship and the energy between us. Have you ever counseled people who have entered into a polyamorous relationship? Yes. And what does that look like? How, they entered into it while seeing you or before you and then came to see before, you? Before. Really? Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. And so that wasn't the reason. I yeah. was seeing the wife. And so she, I wasn't seeing them as a couple. Um, and they actually saw a different sex therapist for those issues. But she's certainly, there were a lot of issues around that issue for her. And so she really shared a lot about what that was like for them yeah. and things that they would communicate about and what the boundaries, they were trying to figure out the boundaries. Oh. And he really wanted her to be able to do things that, you know, she wasn't really comfortable with and things like that. So it was also like, um, it was polyamorous, but there was also some kink in there too. So like he mm. wanted her to, you know, be with another man and film it and then send him the film and things like that. Hmm. Um, there was a kink where he, this husband wanted her to like talk down to him and really humiliate him. So there were things like that in, in the relationship that she struggled with. And so we, yeah. we would explore that. Yeah. Do you know how they're doing if they're still working? I don't. Yeah, I don't. Years? Yeah, I don't know. That I have been years ago. Very curious about polyamorous relationships as of like, yeah. I'd say the last year, um, because I got to know somebody a little bit who was in one mm -hmm. and he actually wasn't a participant yet. Like it was, his wife was developing this relationship with another man. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to have a sexual relationship with that other man. And I was just like, well, how do you do that? You know, like, how do you yeah. have your wife have two relationships with another man? And, you know, of course that made me and my husband curious. And so we've been talking about it and just kind of asking the questions, like, what would that be like? And, you know, how do you, we have younger children too. So just as like, just fantasizing yeah. out loud, it would be like, hi, this is mommy's new boyfriend or <laughs> daddy's new girlfriend. And yeah. I just always just, Honestly, people who are in like throuples and polyamorous relationships yeah, or even open relationships, I just think that is a boundary that is so intriguing. Mm -hmm. It like calls me outward. Like that might be something I would, I don't even know. I'm going to have a bunch of listeners going, you crazy girl. But yeah, it's yeah. just, sometimes I feel like, I don't know where I'm at with just exploring love and connection and how it works. Mm-hmm. If you are that comfortable and that that trusting in a relationship, there's a lot of even theology behind the idea that you're supposed to share that love. You don't mm -hmm. just keep it exclusionary. And right. I've heard a lot of arguments from more queer feminist theology that suggests that's just kind of the way of life or that's what heaven would be like anyway. And oh, interesting. It's, it's just kind of fun to just think about and, and see yourself and, and wonder if you could do something like that, but not even that it, you know, you don't actually have to act on a lot of things that you talk about because the talking itself is like an aphrodisiac. Yeah, absolutely. And the jealousy even can be ta too. Talking about it. Yes. And I love that again in the erotic mind book where he talks about like struggle or obstacles. Yes. Create that in more of that sexual tension and yeah. intensity that just creates a better sexual interaction and experience, right? Yeah. When you have these obstacles. And so t even talking about these things can create those obstacles and then yeah. intensify your sexual relationship. Yeah. I love that part. Um, and what he talks about yeah. the shadow of the third too, doesn't he? I haven't gotten to that part. That, and what that made me more comfortable with was fantasizing and verbalizing out loud a potential third is because there's this idea that when there are two connected and having sex, there's still always a third. And some people mm -hmm. will say that's God. 
And, but for a lot of other people, it's just whatever you're fantasizing to keep your arousal, right? Like, and sometimes right, women right. will be like, sometimes I just imagine I'm under a waterfall or whatever it is. Right, um, right. And so there's this, this power of this third force within you. And I mean, from the Trinitarian standpoint, you know, to becoming one, that there's actually three because God is that ultimate connection. It's right. kind of fun to give that third or that shadow a face or a name Mm -hmm. or an identity within the connection. I might be speaking from experience and just pretending, but it does boost your, for us, it like makes us want sex more with each Uh other. And Uh it just makes it more exciting. We're able to Mm -hmm. verbalize and visualize without stepping outside of our house, you know, and, and taking a deeper risk. And you can act out a lot of, I think, maybe fears that you've had from past relationships or triggers sure. from us that way. But again, what I love what you're saying is, and this goes for anyone who might have more of these out of the box or whatever society has deemed appropriate, anything outside of that really teeny tiny box, very tiny, <laughs> um, very teeny tiny box that you and your husband talk about these things and there's no shame. And that is the key. And so many couples that I work with don't talk about sex. I know. They don't talk about what they like. They don't talk about what they don't like. They don't say harder, softer, faster. Please do that again. Please don't ever do that again. Yes. (laughs) There's just no communication. I know, I know. And it's so sad. And that's where I do shock people because then I'll come right out and say like, well, have you tried this? Have you gone to a sex shop together? Have you done like, you know, come on guys, let's, let's start swinging from the ceiling. Let's do this. Right. And, and it just shocks people, but I'm like, let's talk about it. It's okay. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Um, you know what? I've had a lot of friends who one woman and she shocked the hell on me. She's like, I don't like oral sex. I'm like, oh, you don't like giving your husband head. I get that. No, I don't want a tongue down there. That's gross. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and no joke. And her husband wants to do it so bad, but she won't let him. And I'm like, what the hell's the matter with you? She's had it done well. <laughs> He's like, well, he doesn't know how to do it. And I'm like, well, have you told him how you exactly. like it? Exactly. No. Oh, girl. My husband likes to do a few things on me too. And the other night I finally went, I know you like it. I know you do, but I don't like it. And I, <laughs> I've been letting you do it, but don't do it. Please just no more. And he was like, well, thank you for letting me do it for as long as I wanted to. Okay. <laughs> you know, and that's okay. That's your spouse. Right. Like you, right. Do you not Come bitch on. at them 50 times a day? Like I've asked you to bring that damn garbage out. <laughs> then tell him I said clockwise, not <laughs> counterclockwise. That's okay. You can say, get the oil, get right. the KY, get the right. lube. Right. You can say those things. Yes. You can say, you know what? Turn around. This isn't working for me. Or yeah. And sometimes I'm a little picky. I'll be like, go shave. It's too stubbly, you know, or right. yeah. cologne. You're kind of smelly too. You can be that straightforward. For but sure. Don't do it with shame. Just do right. it with like, I want this to be good. Make it yeah. good. I yeah. have faith in you. I believe in you. Do it like this. And then you take so much anxiety out of it and the mm-hmm. fumbling goes away. But in the beginning, you should also be able to have fun and laugh and try new things and go, well, that's not working, is it? You know? <laughs> and that's okay. Right. Because right. we're not, we're not experts and I don't think no. we ever will be, but we do no. develop an understanding and we can hear each other's bodies harmonies and we can play on that, but we yeah. have the talking. We have to talk about it. We can't assume, we assume and we can't read each other's oh, minds. Yeah. Right. And so like, maybe you had a past sexual experience with someone where they liked it when you did this a certain way or, you know, but, but now your current partner doesn't like that. You know, but you're not supposed to talk about what you did with other partners. You know, that's like a rule with so many people, I think. And, and and you don't necessarily have to, if that's a boundary that, you know, makes somebody insecure or uncomfortable or whatever, but in your mind, like in my mind, if I know that something went a certain way with a different, with another partner yeah. and I'm going to just do the exact same thing with my husband and assume that's going to work. Yeah. He's a different person. Right. And we have to say, do you like this or exactly. there's something I want to try on you? And, right. and you something. know, a lot of the problem is too, is when a spouse does introduce something new, then the other partner's like, where'd you learn how to do that? 
and we get upset. And I think, no, just your wife is, or your husband is curious and pleasing your right. body. Like, right. Don't, I know. Don't make them feel bad and question them and give them a grand inquisition. Cause like, like I said, I was a seasoned lover before I got married. So obviously my husband knew mm-hmm. I was going to try things that I'd probably already tried on other w- men and he the same with other women. And that wasn't something we hated each other for. It was like, but, but because oh, well, she there was liked a, this yeah. well, oh, I kind of like it, you know? And okay, sure. No, I think if a white, well, where did you learn how to do that? And blah, blah, blah. That's her insecurity. Yeah. That's her crap. And yeah. this is, you know, we all do this. We all project our shit onto our partners. Yeah. But like, that's where I would want the husband to say, sweetheart, this is your shit. Yeah. <laughs> Deal yeah. with it. Now yes. lie down and enjoy, you know? Yes. <laughs> like, Just, doesn't right? matter where it came from. Does it feel good? Right. Are you liking like, it? Get over yourself. Yes. I'm not cheating. I'm not like, whatever. Just yeah. like, enjoy. Yeah. Get over yourself. Because yeah. we, we want newness. And that's what keeps, that's what keeps it alive. Like if we're doing the same old freaking position over and over. And that's where pornography can be useful. Yes. Right. I agree. It's like, let's, let's explore. Let's bring, not all the time, but let's yeah. do some research. <laughs> like let's figure this out. Yeah. And you can choose whatever porn you want to look at. So if you're worried right. that porn is going to be too aggressive, yeah, there are some kinky things out there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, my highest recommendation is if you want to make sure your porn is safe and ethical, you pay for it. Mm-hmm. You look for feminist porn. You look for, you look for even gay porn seems to be less raunchy and, and less violent. Um, and mm-hmm. so that's just my advice just from what I've learned. But if you want, if you want to make sure you're getting better porn, you pay for it and it's cleaner yeah. and it's, it's not violent and it's not, it's not demeaning. It doesn't have right. to be objectifying. Um, right. There's right. one thing I want to say about the objectification that okay. I want people to know is what I believe about Eros is outside of Eros, when we are wanting or lusting or desiring for anything, mm-hmm. it is purely from an objective standpoint. We're looking at this thing as an object that we want. It is through Eros. It is through eroticism that we take that object and we turn it into the subject of our existence. Uh That's how that love transforms. And so when people say things like, well, doing it in these positions or watching porn or doing this or doing that objectifies. No, your subject is love. Eros is the subject of love. And what you're doing is you're making that object mean something. You're putting meaning into it. And so when my husband wants to do different things with me, it's not because I'm just a body part that he wants to do whatever with. And that's not what the gist of it is for a lot of people. I'm not saying there aren't creepy people out there. Sure. Of course. They are underdeveloped people that need some help, but Mm -hmm. we have to, I I used to say, I want to be objectified. I want to be the thing my (laughs) husband desires. I want all of this to be the only thing that turns him on. Absolutely. I'm not just an object. I am the subject of his desire and his love. Mm -hmm. And we need to get past this objectification thing. I think whatever powers and principalities of the society that influence the negative took this way of doing things so that we could be a more individualized collective of people and that we could, you know, whatever you want to blame patriarchy and misogyny on. But we have to get away from that sort of thinking when a man wants all of you, or when a woman wants all of you, they want to make you their subject. And I think that's where the power of eroticism is. It takes object to subject form and it makes it meaningful. And it's a connection. It's like a true, authentic, divine connection. And so Mm -hmm. we need to work towards getting away from seeing the body as an object and sex as an object and realize it's part of the subjectivity of the connection. Yes. Yeah. And why it's very important. Um, I'm just an advocate for sex too, though. I mean, sex. Well, makes I know, me happy. And, and so am I. But I think you know, I think where it gets objectified is through, you know, sexual abuse, right? Yeah. Um, and when in pornography, you know, there's this belief, and it could be true. I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've heard a lot of women in porn movies love what they do. They don't yeah. feel like they're being objectified. They feel like they're but being empowering. 
Right. But that's what the message has been, right? That if young boys like have been exposed, then they're being taught you can't watch porn because it's objectifying to women and that's somebody's daughter or sister or yeah. whatever on that screen. And there's all that shame. And it's so interesting to hear porn stars talk and give their stories and how much they, like you said, are empowered and yeah. feel really good about the work that they do. So I, there's just always more than just one side yeah. to these things. Yeah. But I think that's where objectification did, you know, come from and where women or men or boys and girls do get objectified is when they're sexually abused, right? And used for someone else to exert power mm -hmm. over or whatever. And so, but when you're understanding love and relationship, that's like you're saying, that's not objectification. That is saying, yes, you as a person are an object, but I am loving you. Yeah. That's not objectifying you. So it's, it's just really, it's, you always have to look at all these different sides and layers to all of this. There's yeah. so many layers. I agree. So there's never, it's not black and white. No, no. And one bit of advice for one person is never for everybody. Exactly. And that's exactly. such a struggle in our society is you see these books and you see this advice and they're like, and a lot of people will say, well, this is the way it is. Well, no, that was the way it was for that author and that author's clients mm -hmm. and those patients. But mm -hmm. you're just supposed right. to kind of peel that back and think about it a little bit deeper. And that's a scary, that's a scary thing about like, I think what I do too is I don't want people to think my own experience is, is the method of application that you're supposed to take because I had right. a different entire history. Totally. No that totally. Do that. But if right. we're more willing to talk about things, yeah. have discussions like this about Eros and eroticism and, and just our curiosities and confusions about sex, then we can kind of take away the fear and the shame that we're projecting outward into right. society and, and meet people individually so that individual couples can then have their own bit of discussion and discovery with one another. I just, I just don't want people to think I, we're going to, we're those type of people that are like, you should all watch porn now. Everybody go watch <laughs> porn and go get a vibrator. Although I wouldn't recommend a vibrator. I was reading about vibrators and apparently they can, they can wear down um, the walls of your labia and um, just make you numb. And I oh, was like, I, I read that and I'm like, we're done with vibrators, Corey. Okay. <laughs> They're bad. And he's like, what's going on? And so I like had to tell him, but <laughs> and uh, this whole time I'm watching Grace and Frankie, they're selling vibrators and I'm like, Oh, oh that's hilarious. They're selling vibrators to the like most at risk women for the, the thinning, like it's for the elderly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. no, not according to the science I just read. Don't do that. So that's, that's really hilarious. But that's my little side note anecdote. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for sharing that. Don't so. use a vibrator. Use a tongue. No. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a bumper sticker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I would just like to wrap it there. Um, okay, hon. <laughs> this has been fun. Ask Dr. G segment. I hope next time we have people join us, but um, um, we'll open it up to the men. Man, they will be there in a heartbeat. Okay, Honestly, let's there do are it, so girl. many men interested. So that's what we're going to do. But this will be another recorded conversations episode. Awesome. And just thank you again, Dr. Leslie. Thank Brown. you.